Okay, we're on. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Welcome to any new listeners and how are the rest of y'all doing? Is everybody okay? You know, today's episode is coming to you under highly unusual circumstances. First thing is I am going to be foregoing my usual introductory remarks. Next week, the whole conversation is about what's happening right now with the pandemic and our politics even. So I'm going to forego the kind of check-ins I've been doing this week. And that's also because today's episode with Kishore Stein was recorded seven months ago. And that's never happened. It's never happened that there's been so much time between when an episode was recorded and when you're hearing it. And I think it's important for you to know why. Why did this episode never post seven months ago, back when it was recorded? And why are you hearing it now? And in order to do that, I felt like it needed to come from Kishore as well. Like It didn't feel right to just have it be me because... I wasn't the one who decided to not have it post, Kishore was, and I felt like I didn't want to put words in his mouth or say it wrong, and the only way to ensure that it would come out right was to have Kishore's voice as well as mine introduce it. So the first 15 minutes of what you're about to hear was recorded two weeks ago after Kishore and I had reconnected some and we recorded just this brief intro to what you're going to hear today and why. And then you'll hear the full-length conversation that we recorded seven months ago. And it is striking to me how it feels like we're living in almost a completely different world than just seven months ago. But There's still some things that are unresolved, I think. There's unfinished business that needs to be tended to. And I don't think it's a good idea to let the pandemic just overwrite important stuff. I personally have things to work through. (laughs) And talking to Kishore is, is part of that process for me. I do have a few additional remarks that I feel I want to make, but I'm going to make them on the other side. I'd very much like for you to just listen to this first, and then we can have a very short debrief on the other side. But really, that's it. I'm not going to say anything else here. Like I said, this is a kind of unusual situation, and I'm just going to let it be what it is. Like I said, I will talk to you on the other side, but let's go ahead and listen to this introduction and then conversation I had with Kishore Stein. Hello? Hey, Jay. Hello, Kishore. Hey, we made it. We did. (laughs) We made it. Second try, but... We're here now and everything looks great. I think we're totally good to go this time. I'm happy to hear that. All right. Well, listen, I am already recording and maybe we should just get to it. This is a very unusual thing. I've never really done this before. I've never recorded some kind of introduction to a talk with the person I've had the talk with. And so... I, I have a few thoughts about some things that I do think should be said because there's a reason why we're doing this. And, it, and I think there's a few things that people ought to know before they listen to it just so that they understand because it was recorded kind of a while ago now. It was. So what do you think? Well, I first would want to ask you 
Did you come with specific things that you know that you want to say about it? Do you want me to go first? Do you want to go first? Whatever you want is fine by me. Okay. I didn't have anything specific. I just knew that it was a conversation that I was a little nervous about at first and it's probably not sleeping a lot. And I think I said in the conversation, I was both laughing and crying at the same time or whatever. You know, there was a lot uh, of emotion going on during that time in my life. So that's probably the only background. I mean, there's other things about it. There's a history that we didn't probably fully go over, but um, I think overall, uh, it's just um, something that we needed to say. I called you because you wanted someone to reach out from the Iyengar community. And uh, I just wanted to make sure after some time that I responded to your request to put it on the air. Well, let's, let's talk about that because first let's just tell everyone that this conversation was recorded on December 17th, 2019. So it's seven months ago or so more, more than seven months, maybe. And it was scheduled to post on January 20th. And that's pretty common. Usually like between the time an episode is recorded and post is usually about three to five weeks, but this one did not post <laughs> as it was, as it was uh, planned. And you know, it's only like the no, second. I, and I, if you want me to tell you, uh, the audience why briefly, I can. Well, we can. What I will say is, you and I have also talked about having another conversation, even more specifically about it, but. I'll just say for everyone that, you know, January is when Christy Rowe wrote her article about Mark Whitwell and anybody who is listening will remember that time. I remember. And it was really, it was really, I mean, honestly, I remember the email that you sent. Basically you said you, you did not want it published that you didn't feel, I don't think it was safe or comfortable being on the platform because of my affiliation with Mark. I was, right. I was I, completely destroyed, but <laughs> I mean, I and, and I want to also I, say, I want to also say that I, I had every intention, like we had been in touch about it. You, you were very kind to be in contact with me. I remember a not so eloquent email exchange, honestly, right after. And then I remember I had every intention. I was planning to call you when I got back in February because I did that trip to New Mexico. People might remember I recorded an episode while I was there. And then when I got back, I was going to call you. And then that's pretty much when the pandemic hit. So I right. never, I never spoke to you back then. And then honestly, it just, the audio file sat on my desktop in a folder for the last seven months. And then like two, okay. like two weeks ago, I listened to it for the first time. Okay. And, right. And I thought, wow, this is really, this is still an important thing. I and, agree with that, which is why I, I responded to your request to put it on the air is because I, I think it is an important subject and I wish more people would talk about it. Well, I also would say that I, when I sent it to you, like I didn't, my first thought was that you should hear it. You know, like yeah, you should, right. you should get a chance to listen to it yourself, <clears throat> even if you didn't, cause I wasn't even sure like you were going to want to talk to me, honestly, <laughs> you know, cause when we last spoke, you know, I wasn't very liked. Right. I was on Facebook when I learned that you were a student of Mark Whitwell and besides one meeting with him when I was at yoga works, I didn't know him. I mean, I did know of him but i didn't know anything about where he lives um really what he does in terms of in class yoga class and after so many things came up first it was this scandal in iyengar yoga then it was something about yogi bhajan then it was what else buddha there there, there were a lot of different communities spiritual communities that were having articles uh, exposing 
sexual abuse. And then, like you said, Christy Rowe came out with the story. And on my phone, in the, where I look on Facebook, where I did look on Facebook at the time, it blew up. Everybody was just commenting about it and everything. And I had to read deeper into the article to read your name. And once I found out that, I needed to put a pause on everything because everything was just so this side or that side. I just needed to be on the side of the people that were uh, survivors, right? So right. because you weren't, because I didn't hear you coming out saying, Mark Whitwell is not my teacher anymore, I don't support him anymore, because I didn't hear those types of words, I decided, okay, I, I, I don't know enough about this, and I don't want to be on that side supporting it. So I decided to just stop. Right. Right. Well, I did make some statements later on, but it was so right in the moment when it first blew up, when that first happened, when I got that email from you. And that's what we right. planned. That's what you and I talked about having another conversation about, like actually having a conversation about Mark another time. I think it would take too much to get too into it right now. And there is a whole other conversation that people are about to listen to. So right. I don't know if we want to get too deep into it, but I think that absolutely talking about teachers abusing their power and sexual assault and also mm -hmm. it being from... I don't know, the point of view of people who were students of those teachers and then how do they deal with that after they learn about it, you know? That's really, I think, why you wanted it to be um, published, right? I think so. Because I, I think it's, it's very important for people to continue this conversation I think it's important for people to know when they're being touched, if it feels weird, it probably is weird. I think the abuse of power, like you mentioned, is, of course, all over the world, even if it's not in yoga class, but specifically in yoga class, because I personally was such a devoted student to my craft that it took me by surprise, even though I should have seen it coming because I was just so blind by devotion of wanting to be the best for my teachers. And specifically with Manus Omanos, this is why I reached out to you. And it doesn't only have to do with him. Uh, it has to do with also um, a culture. But my experience, you know, I can't just go on and talk about everything. I have to tell my story which is the most important thing about um, telling a story is that you're just telling what you've experienced. So my experience was I was a student of Manuso for a long time. And so that's really what our conversation was about. Yes. And, you know, I just had Max Strom on the show and we talked about this, about when one person is brave enough to tell a story, particularly like a difficult story to tell, it uh, gives a lot of other people freedom to tell their st difficult stories too. And so that's why when I listened to it a few weeks ago, I was like, oh man, Kishore should hear this. And if he, I don't know how he feels about things now, but I think if he's okay with it, other people should hear it too. Is there anything- right, and I, 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 Go ahead. I was just going to ask, is there anything that you would want to say about why there was a change of heart or why you decided to um, publish it? Now, was, I know you and I had another, like an off, off record conversation, which may have something to do with it, but right. I, I don't know if there's anything you want to say about that or not. Well, I do, I, it's fine. Um, I first heard after I decided not to publish it that you went on there's a short podcast that I listened to mm. about that you are no longer going to be able to support Mark Wickwell. Yeah. And I thought, okay, this, this is great. But it didn't really go over well, I thought. I thought you could have done it differently or I'm, I'm just not sure what to say about that. But at the time, I just didn't feel like, okay, I'm going to publish this with Jay. 
I thought, you know, I'm just going to leave this alone because what I'm hearing for some reason isn't working. Some reason people are still commenting. I don't feel right about it. That was the biggest thing was, okay, I just don't feel. But then you sent me an email and you told me that you're no longer supporting him. And this has been a while. I haven't been on Facebook about this much since then. And I don't know you really well, but because you mentioned to me that you're no longer supporting him, and I think that's really brave, and I think that's a big deal, and I think that people should know about that. I think that this should just be published not only in support of everyone and not only in support of my story, but in support of you, the fact that you don't want to support this uh, teacher anymore. I think it's great. Well, I really appreciate that, Kishore. And I, I want to say to you that like, your courage in getting back to me and saying, yes, I would like to have people hear this is going to be an impetus for me, like we said, to have another conversation because part of me doesn't want to talk about Mark. You know, like It would be easier not to <laughs> in a way because the pandemic happened and it kind of blew over and nobody's emailing me about that anymore, you know? But okay. So, you know, from like a PR standpoint, it's kind of stupid. Like, why am I bringing up this thing? But right. I, but I'm not interested in the PR. <laughs> I'm interested in like, you know, the truth. And I think that there's still all these wounds that not just you and me, but a lot of other people have around this stuff. So I, I, I'm using this as an opportunity to talk about it more. So just to say thank you Good. for that for that to entered and to say that's the spirit of us i think coming back together after all these months to share it nice yeah it's it's a good reason and uh, i think that these teachers that do this that sexually abuse students or bullies i think they need to be um outed if you will people people need to know about it now I think that there's a gray area, but when you start having people talk about sexual abuse, that's pretty serious. And yeah. I'm glad that we, we, we connected again, because honestly, I like this format that you're doing, and I like that you've been able to admit, just like I have, that we used to have a teacher that we admired, that we stood with that we maybe talked about, I did, and now we don't, and it kind of hurts. Yes. But, you know, yes, that's life. Yes. Life means yeah. that you, yeah, so yeah. Thanks, for, uh, thanks for being out there, and thanks for saying that you no longer support Mark Whitwell, and I no longer support Manuso Manos. I also no longer teach Iyengar Yoga. Mm. And this is not to say that I don't teach yoga, but, you know, it's come. It's it's really just about your experience, your story, and sharing it with everybody else. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, Kishore. I think that might be good. We'll talk more. Like what you were just saying about us both having teachers and that hurting. Like that's what the uh, the next conversation will be about. You know. <laughs> nice. And um, yeah. Thanks, Kishore. We'll we'll let everybody listen to it. We'll get feedback, and um, we'll be in touch. Okay. Yes. All right. You take it easy. All right. I'll, I'll talk to you later. You too. Bye. Okay. Bye. Hello. Are you there? Uh, yeah. Hi. Can Kish you hear me? I can hear you now. Hello, oh, Kishore. God. Hello, Jay Brown. How are you, sir? How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you. All right. How are well, you? I'm pretty good, all things considered. Kind of a hectic couple of days, but it settled down today, and I'm glad to be sitting down for a minute to have a talk with you. Oh, nice. Glad to hear it. I'm sitting down, too. <laughs> cool. You're, are, are you settled in? Do you need to get anything, some water or anything? Actually, I got a cup of water, and uh, I got a pair of headphones on, uh -huh. uh, so, and uh, I don't know. I, I think we're good. It sounds fine, and I think we're good to go. Okay. You're on the... West Coast, right? Oh, yeah, California. I see. Well, whereabouts are you? San Diego. Oh, okay. Well, you You're know, in I, New York, right? 
I am in Pennsylvania, actually. Oh, okay, okay. But um, I grew up in Los Angeles. And, oh, me too. And oh, yeah, where did you grow up in Los Angeles? Well, right near Culver City, but the mailing address is Los Angeles. Uh huh. Uh, uh-huh. My dad had a house in Rancho around uh, Cheviot Hills, uh, yeah. and spent a lot of time in Santa Monica. Uh, uh-huh. the west the west side like near venice beach yes i know it well like i grew okay. up in the valley canoga park oh. woodland hills region okay but as soon as i got old enough to have a car and i had some friends who got older and got out of high school they all had apartments in venice oh yeah so i would go hang out there quite a bit spend time in santa monica so I, that's like the only other place i know besides new york really is that i grew okay. up there oh it's a great place I haven't been there in many years. When did you leave? About two years ago. Oh, okay. So I mean, I've come and gone. I've lived, you know, like for a year or two in other places. But for the most part, I spent uh, most of my time in L.A. And then I, my wife and I left uh, about two years ago. I see. Well, Kishore, I have to say, I, I, from the email exchange we had, it seems like you're not necessarily a regular listener of the show. And I'm curious, what, what was it that originally prompted you to reach out to me and email me? Did someone point you to it, or how did you find out about me? Well, the reason why I contacted you was that I heard, hey, at the end of your show, if you have anything to say or if you've been uh, touched inappropriately, maybe you said that, but in my mind, that's what I've been thinking about. Yeah. And uh, if you have anything that you want to say, reach out. So then I went on your website. But when I first heard your show is because it was on Facebook and someone shared a link of one of your shows. I see. I see. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Cause not so long ago I had a conversation with Donna and I believe that after that conversation, I made sort of a, I, I mentioned that I've been reaching out to a lot of different people and trying to see if we could have some conversations about things that have been happening in the young art community. I think for a really long time that never get talked about. And people were really intimidated and didn't want to come on. And I understood why, but it it seemed like a very, uh, even more so than when I was trying to have conversations about the Ashtanga community. And so I did at the end of that conversation sort of put out a plea and say, Hey, if you know anybody wants to have a conversation, reach out to me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) that, that That was the show. Yeah, that was the one. Yeah, yeah, so you, was the, and I, the, I had never heard your show before that. I see. And you're like, well, okay, I, right. I took up the call. <laughs> right. And then I, I, I listened to a couple of shows after that just because, you know, I, I used to listen to the radio a lot in L.A. Mm-hmm. Uh, before it became internet radio, I used to listen to the radio just in the car. Right. And uh, so I'm a fan of like this, this format. Well, or at least interviews. I like interviews too. So like, and I've heard a lot of interviews, but then I, I honestly like, you know, hadn't heard your show. So then that's when I contacted you. Cool. I mean, I think, I do think podcasts are sort of in my mind, just old radio, but on the internet. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And, yeah. and I think they're great because it allows you to just have a format that's kind of, it's global, obviously. Yeah. And it's what you want to do. Yeah, there's no, I, there's no one saying you need to do this or that. No, and I think also for me, having had a history in like the blogosphere world where you write like a, a snarky 800 word something to get a conversation started, but mostly an argument started. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> to have, yeah. To have um, a, a format like this that's long form and it just allows for like a more real conversation and more nuance. Yeah, I got that impression well, actually, from our emails, you were like, this is a conversation. And yeah, uh, that, that made me feel a little more comfortable. Good. I appreciate that you reached out. Um, just to clue anybody in who's listening who may not know what we're talking about, the conversation I had with Donna was about specifically a teacher named Manuso Manos, who you know, was decertified after having been credibly shown to have been a sexually assaulting and abusing people. And I think he was decertified. And more recently, there was a little bit of an uproar. I'm, I'm, I'm betting you heard about this, that there was uh, some workshops that were organized for him. 
that yes. were kind of like on the down low that there's still people who support him. Um, and that's right. And I think that, you know, a lot of folks sometimes will say, well, I never experienced any of that firsthand. And, and then there's becomes this mix of, um, sort of, I don't know, it's, it becomes a little bit of a hedge and also a little bit of a bypass very often to those who really were uh, mistreated. And I, I appreciate that you reached out because you're somebody who knows him well. And you, I've, been, I've been in a lot of his workshops. Well, I, started, I, I, I started studying, what, what do you mean well? Well, no, I, you mean I, like, I mean that you have direct experience of him and you knew him since the time you were a teen. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to get. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, because uh, I, I think that uh, I'm curious to hear from you what, what your experience of him is and you felt compelled to come forward. So clearly you have something to say. I guess the first thing is, as we just mentioned, you know him since you were a teen. How's that possible? How did you meet him when you were in such a young age? Well, that had to do with my mother. Huh? Uh, when my parents split up, my mother found yoga around Hollywood. Uh, it was, it was popular up there. And then pretty soon she found the Iyengar Yoga Institute. And then I started going there. And then and pretty soon after that, I was going to his workshops. How old were you when you first went to an Iyengar yoga class? Oh, you know, I, I actually, I, Thing, I'm pretty sure I knew you were going to ask that question. And honestly, I don't remember my first class. Mm -hmm. I don't remember this. Like I, I've, I've actually read blogs and stuff. of I remember my first class and how it felt. I, I just don't remember the first time I stood in front of him or was, was in his class. And I, I, I don't have that memory clearly or, or but anything. Do, I, do you have an idea about how young you were? Like was it younger than 16 yeah, I know I was younger than 16. Yeah. Uh, but when I started to drive is especially when I began to go more regularly. Uh, because right after school, I would either go to my dad's business and work or immediately go to the Iyengar Institute. So it was, uh, you know, maybe 14 years old, 15 years old. I, I just don't remember a particular age. So Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. I just, no, I just that's okay. Have. That's okay. I'm just trying to get a sense of, because again, I didn't start going to any kind of yoga classes until I was in my early 20s. Okay. So the idea of being exposed to yoga that young is novel to me. You know, that's, yeah, I'm, yeah, always, yeah. I'm always curious about that. And in fact, you mentioned to me in an email that you have even earlier experiences that you grew up in the <laughs> Hare Krishna movement. Yeah, that right? yeah, that's right. So, I that's mean, you right. even have more background before yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So I, how... I, how early do you remember that? Like your parents were in the movement when you were born? Yeah, they were, my mother and father were from the East Coast. My dad grew up in Ohio, my mom in New Jersey. They found the devotees uh, at Kent, they met at Kent State. And then pretty soon uh, my older brother was born. And then I was born in Chicago near a temple there. And then my younger brother was born in Dallas, where they had the Krishna community had their first school called the Gurukula. And then we moved to L.A. pretty soon after that. So some of my earliest memories are in Dallas, probably, but not very much. My real memories are from Los Angeles, where, you know, I'm like bowing down to gurus that are coming into, you know, the community from traveling a lot and, uh, uh, there's, the, there's a temple on Watseka Avenue. It used to be on La Cienega, but I remember Watseka Avenue. And um, I uh, remember being a kid sitting, you know, in the temple. And uh, my mom homeschooled me. And also we developed a class. It wasn't very professional. You know, there wasn't like certificates or, you know, people that were like real professional school teachers at the time. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. They were like young, young men and women who joined the spiritual movement during like, you know, the Vietnam era. And then as like time progressed, it became more professional and more uh, together. But uh, until elementary school, they had a school and that's where I went. 
after elementary school, they didn't have it together to develop any kind of school. So after that, I started going to private schools. But the whole time, my family, instead of, you know, aunts and uncles and grandpa and grandma, I mean, I, I, I knew who they were, but I didn't spend significant time with them. My family was uh, at the temple. And I, you know, I, I guess the reason why I brought this up to you is because coming to Iyengar Yoga from a background of gurus and uh, knowing the Vedas and chanting and kirtans and the word yoga already just being, you know, kind of familiar, uh, it, it, it already not only established my faith in the guru, so I love the idea of, you know, Iyengar is the guru, but we had a guru, I, I still hold him dear, and uh, coming to Iyengar yoga, I also knew it had to be a good student, you know, I was always a good devotee uh, in, in my community at the Krishna temple. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a friend on some while back on the show named Hari Kirtan Das, and he talked about the Hare Krishna movement, which he was in since the early time. And he talked some about what you said, how early on it was a much more like kind of coming out of the hippie times, idealistic thing. And then eventually it kind of grew and became those people at the airport. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah like there yeah, was like yeah. a, there was like an evolution in that movement yeah. over time. Well, now, now people, uh, it's interesting you mentioned that because now I, I've actually done it a few times at the airport, by the way. Okay. And, uh, it, it was a pretty enlightening experience, you know. Yeah, uh, what, you know, selling what, selling books at the airport. Yeah, well, that's interesting because he talked about that though as being something that happened later on. Is and and what he saw is more of like um, a bit of a power thing that in the early days it was much more education, like Gita studies, but then at some point it became about more missionary oh, yeah. missionary work or something, you know. Well, also you have to understand that when the guru leaves, sometimes there's a lot of uh, upheaval. Mm -hmm. So with the Hare Krishna movement, when the guru left, you've got other people who decided they want to be a guru. And that, that became a problem. Uh, that's part of the upheaval. The other part of the upheaval is you had abuse of children uh, in these gurukulas because people just weren't professional. They didn't have a real... Uh, uh, oversight. Uh, but now, now they're trying to make it really quite professional. They're trying to make it almost like a business. Like, you know, now we have to have, you know, like degrees. Uh, we have to have certificates. You have to, they're trying to now make it really quite like branding it. And mm -hmm. I respect that. I may not disagree with it. I, I mean, I may not agree with it. I don't really think that it's, it's really supposed to be like that. It's more of a mystical experience for me. Mm -hmm. but uh, I, I still think it has value. I mean, if, if, if you're going to have classes on the Bhagavad Gita, if you're going to have great vegetarian food, you know, I'm, I'm all for that. Yeah, I know. But it's, it's an interesting thing what you say. It's the same in the yoga world that the, the standardization process yeah. kind of has its advantages and disadvantages, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's the same thing as with, with Iyengar yoga. You have... Uh, a time when there were no certificates. In fact, I, one time I asked the question, maybe it was to Manuso, but it could have been to somebody else. And I said, do you remember a time when uh, there were no certificates? And, you know, the story was told to me of, yeah, usually it was like, okay, uh, John called Bob and John asked Bob, do you know Cindy? Oh yeah, I know her. Oh, uh, do you think she should be certified? Sure. Yeah. She's been coming to class and she's great. Okay, good. That was it. You know, <laughs> yes. now you have, you know, a whole thing where you have to, you know, it's a form you have to fill out. There's uh, well, but you see, I mean, this is maybe a too far jump ahead. We could come back to it later, but just recently I noticed that, I mean, the younger training was always like a year's long program. Sometimes it took a long time to jump through all those hoops yeah, it was three years. Yeah, it was considered a gold standard of training. And only yeah. recently, like in the last two weeks or something, it was announced that they're now a registered yoga school at the 200-hour and 300-hour, 500-hour level. Well, yeah, and because, I was like, yeah. what? <laughs> that just, to me, know, comparatively to like this early time that you're talking about when they were yeah. the ones. like, And they were the holdouts. They weren't registered. They didn't need to be. They were considered way more credible. 
Yeah, this has been going on on Facebook. I, I've been uh, making friends on Facebook about all this. Mm. And well, pe- pe- people are upset about that. Yeah, well, let's, let's put a pin in that one because I want to go back to this earlier time. And, you know, your first experiences, you said how you had previous experience with gurus. So that was nothing new to you. And you embraced, did you embrace Mr. Yungar as a guru to you? Did you ever meet him? I, I've met him a few times. Yeah. Uh, your first question, did I ever embrace him as my guru? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I never thought this is the man that's going, that I'm going to surrender to and it's going to bring me to God and I'm going to touch his lotus feet, as, as it says in, in like, you know, the songs with the Vaishnava Acharyas. I, I didn't feel that way about him. Right. Because I, I already had that, that experience with my guru in, in, in the movement in, uh, in uh, the temple. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I did respect the position. And I respected him as a person who is going to give me knowledge and who I am going to uh, surrender to that knowledge and, and, and be humble and accept that knowledge and practice. So uh, I, I also thought that was a higher calling because looking around other yoga studios, I would see people just sort of, you know, maybe artistically just creating their own style of movement, right? And being in class in Manuso's classes and other teachers, but he was the main teacher for me. I would uh, hear Guruji's name, Mr. Iyengar's name. It wasn't until later that they called him Guruji. Uh, I would hear Mr. Iyengar's name and, you know, people would come back from India and say, like, he's saying this now. And they would give reports about what he's like and they would give pictures and stuff. So I, I, I did... Uh, enjoy that and i did find that to be a value and i you know when you're in a community you also get caught up in that uh, and that's maybe that's a negative way of saying it but it's also a way of of sharing your love for the guru because your love for the guru is directed to god as it's said in the vedas now th- that's a whole nother conversation but well um, i would say that at that time the lineage traditions was the only way to establish credibility. So having studied with him or whatever, being a senior teacher is what would, what made you qualified and did distinguish it from other, like, I just remember when I first went to an younger, younger class, it felt like way more serious and it wasn't like as hippy dippy. Let's like contemplate your navel. There wasn't chanting. It was like right. really like down to business and serious minded. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree that, with that. That, that. That was appealing to me at that time too. It's, it's felt smarter. Yeah, that, that, I agree. <laughs> it felt smarter. Yeah. <laughs> now, whether it was smarter is another Right, right, right. <laughs> like, no, I'm I, not I, suggesting I, that it is necessarily, right, but right, I, right, right. at that time it felt that way to me, which is why mm-hmm. I was attracted to it initially. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And that... And the way you use those words, I agree with that too. All right. Well, what was your, what are your initial what, uh, memories? Like what are your initial impressions of him from those early times? Like when you were before 16, before you were driving yourself, when your mom was still taking you to class, do you have you any, so? yeah. Do you have any impressions of what did you think uh, of him back then? I, I just was, he was kind of always like my rock and roll star. Uh-huh. Okay. I, I was not the kind of kid that rebelled. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more rebellious now, you know, now that I'm a, an adult, right? But uh, I was the kind of kid that would, like, listen to his mom, listen to his dad. Uh, I was the kind of kid that would not go out and break curfew and go out to concerts and not tell his parents and do drugs. I, I wasn't that kind of kid. So when I saw Manuso, he was, uh, you know, had an attitude and... Uh, most of the teachers that I met, uh, they didn't have that kind of attitude. They were more into trying. And plus, L.A. is a little bit more politically correct. And, uh, you know, I think so. He wasn't like that. You know, he would he would uh, yell mm-hmm. and uh, he would uh, uh, tell people what to do, which, you know, the, the confidence to me was infectious. Uh, I, I had fun mostly because. I was around people and I got into my body. It was physical. 
Um, it, it hurt because I was very tight. I was never flexible to start out with. <clears throat> um, my early memory is uh, kind of, you know, like, like in, in awe, just being like, hey, here, here's, a, here's a male figure that I can look up to. Here's a male figure that, you know, I want to uh, emulate, you know. Here's someone that's real, that's in the flesh, that is talking about yoga, but is also uh, uh, saying uh, exactly the way it is, because he, he's, he's an opinionated guy. That, that was my impression. Mm. And he's also a strong character, okay? Yeah. So that, that strength of that character I liked, because when I was that age, uh, I, I was sort of like... Uh, I didn't exactly, I wasn't exactly able to speak up for myself, right? I was, I was more of the meek and humble type. I, I did plays at school, uh, not plays at school, I did plays at the temple where I was able to uh, 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 be on stage. But uh, when it came to one-on-one -on -one and came to making friends, I was more shy. So to see him be on stage and talk to... Uh, people and say, you know, exactly the way it is. I, I was attracted to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I had a similar experience where the teachers I gravitated to were the ones who tended to be more of the rogues, right? The ones who would cuss, yeah. and like who would, who would in some way, um, give a glimmer of he, a human behavior that wasn't guru ish, uh, or something or that was, um, irreverent. Yeah. More real. More yeah, real ir to me. irreverent in some way because I like that little punk yeah, 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 me too. thing or something. Yeah. Um, and I also liked I I liked teachers who would at, at one point, and this is something I say a lot. Like I I thought there was something wrong with me, like I was kind of broken, and so in that in that mind frame, I wanted a teacher to kick me in my ass. <laughs> You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah, it like makes sense to like yeah, totally torture yourself <laughs> yeah, <it does. laughs> when you feel that way, you know? Yeah. I, in fact, uh, it was later that I heard that old story of BKS Iyengar bang kick slap. You know what I mean? I don't know. What is that specifically? Oh, oh, to? no, no. Okay. Uh, later when I, when I got a little older and I started to hear, uh, Iyengar stories, uh, I heard he went to England first and there was a story of a student in England uh, that she was a lady and the classes he taught there, she said, oh, we used to call him bang, kick, slap, you know, for BKS. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I related to that, right? Because even before I met Mr. Angar, I saw Manuso like as that. And I didn't, I didn't think there was anything particularly wrong with it. I just said, okay, this is, this is Hatha yoga. This is Iyengar. This is he, his guru is Iyengar and this is Hatha yoga. And this is kind of severe. And that's how I accepted it. And you're right. I, the, the cussing and the irreverence. Yeah. I was attracted to that. Sure. Definitely. And so you, he was emulating bang, kick, slap. He was he hitting people and doing that same stuff like we see in the video? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think more than anything, the banging was with blocks because I think it, it would make it sound louder. That was my impression. Like he would use these white foam blocks that if you, if you hit in a certain way, it would just sound really loud in class. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the kicking, it would be like, uh, you know, maybe not like karate chop kicking, but it would obviously be like, you know, knee in the back and, you know, it wasn't really like, oh, let's, let's make sure this student isn't hurt or uh, feels okay. Nah, just, you know, boom, you know, and uh, bang. Yeah, like uh, sometimes you would, uh, you, you know, I remember Manuso came back from, uh, and I'm, calling, I'm fast forwarding this a little bit. Mm -hmm. He came back from India one time saying that, uh, uh, Iyengar taught something, I'm, I'm abbreviating all this, Iyengar taught something, then he tried to teach the same thing, and while he was trying to teach the same thing, Iyengar comes in back of him and smacks him on the top of the head, you know, smacking, hitting, banging, and then my, my memory is Manuso was the same kind of, of you know, teacher, you know, and he, it was, it was, it was I, I, I saw it as old school, 
paging. I, I, that's how I, I understand. I know. Cause I remember that time it was one of the reasons why I didn't, I didn't really like the young guard classes. <laughs> Those were mean. I thought they were mean. I yeah, and, yeah. and I think that, you know, when I've had these conversations with people, like, cause some people who come on the show, I've talked to a bunch of different people who were hit by teachers and some of them don't mind. Some of them were like, oh, he was just bringing my awareness. And there's different people have different experiences of those kicks and those slaps. But when you watch the videos of like Mr. Youngar, like hitting someone because they didn't fold the blankets right, that to me doesn't seem to be about helping the student have more awareness or their alignment or anything. That's just him flying off the handle and being a dick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, I agree with you there. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it so bluntly, but you know, and, and the, the challenging part is we were, there was a deference to these people and there is to Manuso where he's considered like this senior teacher and there's a kind of like a, a pass given on it. Yeah. Yeah. The senior teacher thing. I agree. Definitely. There's a pass given on it. And so I guess when at any point, did you ever see something that he was doing either to you or someone else that made you pause? You're like, maybe is this fucked up? Why? You know, like, yeah, actually it's interesting you bring this up. Cause now that I've been thinking about this, uh, this is after, you know, I was 16 cause he used that age. Uh, when I was going to a lot of workshops, there was a moment. Um, I think my earliest moment that I thought, wait a minute, this, this, this doesn't feel right. Uh, there was a lady demonstrating Uttanasana and the instructions were to move the thighs back, the top thighs back. So the back releases, those are the words that often, you know, he uses in class. Uh, everybody was watching, uh, and he, uh, came up from behind her and he put a blanket on her backside and he put his hips, uh, against the blanket. So in between her backside and his hips was a blanket and he was, you know, with, with one hand, he, he held like, it looked like he held her waist, I guess, but he was holding her thighs back as far as I could tell. <clears throat> and, um, it, it, it was a strong hold, you know, it was, it was, it was pulling her in and his other hand was, uh, on her back, her lower back. And partly was the way he was holding her. And it, it, that, that was like, huh. Okay, this is, this is a little aggressive. But then the way that he was uh, pushing the skin of her lower back down uh, quite, quite fast and uh, vigorously is the best way I could probably describe it. I thought, okay, this, this is just too much. Like, well, why are you doing that? And, and it, just, it, just, it just created an uncomfortable moment inside of me. And I didn't know what to do with that at the time. I just thought, oh, and of course, now talking about it, you, you can tell that I remember that based on the feeling that I had in, inside, like, okay, that, that feeling stuck with me. And I thought, okay, this is, this is just too much. Now, because there were so many other things in the classes of, you know, where we're talking about just, you know, bang, kick, slap, and, you know, you were talking about the blankets and being a dick and stuff like that, because I, because I was all just wrapped up in that it didn't have a profound effect of, Oh my God, let's run out the room. Right. I didn't, that wasn't what I did. I stayed in class and, you know, I moved my thighs back and I learned, but I remember that moment as being, wait a minute, that, that, that's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, I, I mean, of late, I've been having a number of conversations about how, when things happen, even in these groups of people where somebody like does something crazy, like wrap someone's legs around them. And, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the New York times article recently, that it doesn't necessarily register as something wrong. Even yeah, though I, I, I have been be. reading the articles and yeah, yeah, I agree with you. It doesn't automatically register. Yeah. All right. Well, what, what did you personally experience with him? What things has he done to you? Have you ever been hit by him directly? Yeah. Um, I remember, um, let me think here. Okay. So one time, for example, I was in a back bend. I was demonstrating and we were at the wall. 
uh, and my feet were at the wall. I mean, do you want me to just? Like, yes, no. I, I, st- I, I, oh, I would okay. like to hear the context because I'm curious. You said earlier, like he would go up and you know hit someone or kick someone. So, like, what would cause that? Like, why would that happen? So, what you what you were doing gives us a clue as to what might prompt him to do that to somebody. Well, first of all, let me say that like my experience usually was that because I was always keeping eye contact with him when he was looking around the room, especially when he was on kind of a story about Iyengar or describing a pose and everybody was huddled around him and, and like, you know, watching, uh, I was always really attentive to every detail that he was uh, teaching. So I, I followed instructions very well. So I, I never really got yelled at much. It wasn't me that got yelled at. It was other people. I, w- I would actually be like, like in class sometimes over the years being like, oh, come on, you're not. He's just- if you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.